Hello, my name is Mario Hibbert. I'm from Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina. I teach at the University of Sarajevo Faculty of Philosophy, Department of Comparative Literature and Librarianship. And I'm going to present my paper named Loss of the Social, Return of the Private, Compromising the Failures in the Age of Boudoir Surplus. It's tempting to start a discussion about this very topic at the moment when existence of syntax of public life can hardly refer to physical dimensions of social communication. Participatory consent of the global citizenry to project its communicative behavior to cybernetic technology that powerfully transforms human experience through our voluntary commitment led me to assume that public without its counterpart, private, like the proper context, to start a discussion over the role in, of the libraries and the future of their users. Privacy shortage in the digital era is a consequence of intrusive but well-hidden embeddedness of non-human agency of software to everyday lives of the citizens, of netizens. It challenges our public behavior, either as information consumers, whose communicative desires prevent us from being responsible for data exchange interactivities, as long as class compromise prevails class struggle, or information concealers, obsessed with privacy protection tools and techniques making us antisocial androids whose irregular or paranoid optic enables creativity beside and beyond ordinary memory of the global mind. Libraries make a huge effort to provide a sanctuary for the social by serving public needs. For that sake, librarians are educated to cope with the most of up-to-date services, develop tough skills needed to prolong its cyber existence, no matter how tendencies of live streaming literacy have become more important than critical thinking. If we agree with the fact that the notion of public is reduced to a database full of users, as Geert Lovnik points out, Public life in terms of library offerings could reappear only as we librarians engage in cherishing humanity assets by creating privacy oasis and anonymity to all comers. But it would be also a sign of a significant compliance with the prevailing dogma introduced by cybernetic totalists. Instead of offering protection over algorithmic control, libraries should find its peace as well as peace for their users by enabling patrons to question the dominant narrative of our times, to offer ideas out of the mainstream boxes of digital mind control. In other words, to resist, I quote Jerome Lanier, that biology and physics will merge with computer science, becoming biotechnology and nanotechnology, resulting in life and physical universe becoming mercurial. Of course, the comp Compatibility of the internet and library is obvious, but it should not mislead us only because our delivery services could be enhanced in unprecedented ways. Moreover, keeping our focus solely on the internet's front end. The narrative behind the internet's dominant corporative players and its platforms warn us to rethink to whom we have given our trust in managing information ecology. In his book, the Googleization of Everything, Shiva Vaidyanathan discloses how Google's infrastructural imperialism results in public failure that, I quote, occurs when instruments of state cannot satisfy public needs and deliver services effectively. Google appropriates from librarianship its ongoing mission to organize world information and make it universally accessible and useful, which leads Vaidyanathan to notice I quote, when Google does something adequately and relatively cheaply in the service of the public, public institutions are relieved of pressure to perform their tasks well. This is an important and troubling phenomenon I call public failure. The end of quote. Asking ourselves how to preserve the valuable parts of the old forms of governance, or at least balance them with the new ones, may sound naive witnessing cyber technologies extending communication capitalism in a dystopian scenario. Moreover, a new mode of production turned peer-to-peer -peer production, along with free and open source software movement, a new mode which actualizes radical possibilities of post-scarcity economy, 
as the new major terrain of social struggle still does not circumvent the cultural logic of technological determinism. To be more precise, do libraries have to redefine its public service according to engagement in extensions of literacy, accepting a reality of digital corporatism, or recreate their future by engaging in recuperation of the disappearance of the social that has imploded in media, as Jean Baudrillard noticed. If we admit that in digital network age, social elements manifest themselves through a compelling logic of technological fetishism, or as Geert Lovning emphasizes, that the, I quote, the term social has effectively been neutralized in its cynical reduction to data pool. The end of quote. Then the responsibility of librarians could be resisting to uncritically enforce such a paradigm enforcement that Pat Demers noticed is being encroached even by humanists and social scientists under the agenda of digital humanities. As a matter of fact, libraries should rather embrace mystic approach to totality of its public, moreover discovery of the whole universe as an erotic object. Just as the act of reading and making love should enable us to transformatively lose ourselves in otherness. Quite the contrary, immediate arousal of digital that virally reduces social to, I quote, calculated opportunities of live streaming proves its disruptive nature returning, I quote, as a revolt against the unknown and unwanted agenda, Wagyu, populist, radical Islamists driven by good-for-nothing beings. The end of quote <coughs> by Gert Lovnik. In other words, librarians' literacy in the context of intellectual framing of digital should encompass responsibility not to forget that pornography does not dwell in media content, but its structure, creating ecstasy of communication. As Baudrillard noticed, I quote, <clears throat> Today there is a whole pornography of information and communication, that is to say, of circuits and networks. A pornography of all function and objects in their readability, their fluidity, their availability, their regulation, in their force signification, in their performativity, in their branching, in their polyvalence, in their free expression. The end of quote. I'm not trying to sound technophobic but to point on how libraries cope with the lack of this scientific skepticism every time pressure to enhance the public life ends up in techno-rational techno attitude catching up with cybernetic progress. Failure to deny hegemonial logic of surveillance capitalism and its effects to a public life makes libraries a betters in dehumanization processes. Shoshana Zuboff recently published published an article in Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung in which she warned of exceptional appetites of capitalism, new invasive power that modifies human behavior where users became a means to profit in a new kind of marketplace in which they are neither buyers nor sellers nor products, but the source of free raw material that feeds a new kind of manufacturing process. Similarly, Matteo Pasquinelli courses how vast amount of global, da data set, global data sets, according to a specific vector or the eye of the algorithm, are being recorded in search for common patterns of behaviors in social media, suspicious keywords in surveillance networks, buying and selling tendencies in stock markets, or the oscillation of temperature in a specific region. Emphasizing the rise of the metadata society, Certainly, libraries change people's behavior as well, so what the heck? If we are about to perceive libraries as bastions of free culture, are we not responsible for creating spaces radically different from the notion of cognitive rent, protecting its users from exploitative platform capitalism? For Matteo Pasquinelli, Google is a rentier of the common intellect and the acceptance of library neutrality towards cognitive capitalism clearly should not be an option. Librarians, besides defending free and open internet architecture, net neutrality, and public digital commons, in which class struggle reappears alongside its productive freedoms emerging from a flexible networks or nodes of interest, mobilizing resources on a planetary scale, 
are now called to face the post-Snowden digital divide in terms of the engagement to provide its users ability to understand and use privacy tools. In the recent edition of Journal of Radical Librarianship, Jan Clark writes about the librarian's commitment in protecting the intellectual privacy of their users, or at least need to familiarize with the existing privacy-enabling tools. I quote from his article. Librarians have played a key role in tackling digital inequality and must continue to work to eradicate such inequality, ensuring autonomy of internet use and supporting citizens in protecting themselves from mass state and corporate surveillance. Once the most influential architects for self-realization, the library as the instrument of self-discovery has been mistaken for a big data paradigm that opens before us in fast and furious ways. Needless to say, we need to think of redesigning its infrastructure with the ruins within the ruins of the old. Pressuring libraries to legally and technically adhere to value property over access and scarcity over abundance seem to be gaining generational resistance articulated in radical and progressive attitudes of librarians who understand their mission not anymore as gatekeepers, but gate punkers. Still, while we are critically reappropriated our social responsible duties, or even won the battle over the content and free flow of information, our defeat moved elsewhere. Mackenzie's work alerts us on this, that while old cultural industries tried to put information back into the property form, there was an emergence of vulture industries whose strategy was not to try to stop the flow of free information, but rather to see it as an environment of, to be leveraged in the service of creating a new kind of business aiming to control the metadata. Expectations of narrowness, speed and convenience, as Vidian Hoidianata noticed, make us blind to the fact that globalization of knowledge, habituated by the recent technological achievements, which alter global users' beliefs regarding the Internet's ability to automatically universalize experience, knowledge, or communication, actually features indeterminacy between public and private. The Internet does not provide the social space or norms that Habermas described or prescribed for a healthy public sphere. Moreover, letting information, more precisely data, to roam free. We let vultures to profit on, I quote, behavioral surplus. Shoshana Zubov notices as a shift in the use of data, explaining how Google made an historic turn in recognizing how to repurpose its growing cache of users' data before regarded as a waste, now reused as an investment. Having in mind that understanding is a reflection of the social dimensions of knowledge. I believe that libraries should more should show more eagerness in taking responsibility for their users' digital public life on the basis of their totality, as well as their commitment to creativity, which has a special capacity of imagination. Librarians' capability to theorize these issues has to be rediscovered. Encouraging the processes of evolutionary dead-end as the latest cultural logic of commercial algorithmic surveillance. We don't seem to care enough that this leads to an absence of seeking a deeper comprehension beyond a disruptive nature of the social run by a softer codes, which is, I quote, threatening existential and political canon of the modern liberal order defined by principles of self-determination that have been Century, for centuries, even millennia in the making. Blurring the facts with the new epistemic order that mathematizes the abnormal in the metadata society, animalities of the commons, as Pasquinelli puts it, asks for institutions capable to explore, actualize, yet reclaim massive computing power as a basic right of civil society and its autonomy. I wonder if this call is addressed to libraries. Whenever I form questions 
on our global hybrid identities. I see how the mass digital culturalization of the social depoliticized our lives, reducing its bias to profit as a measure of value. In other words, I quote Alberto Manguel, in order to create and maintain the huge and if efficient machinery of financial profit, we have collectively chosen speed over deliberate slowness, intuitive responses over detailed critical reflection, the satisfaction of reaching snap conclusions rather than the pleasure of concentrating on the tension between various possibilities without demanding a conclusive end. If profit is a goal, creativity must suffer. Repeatedly emphasizing through this text that we live in the cage of data poor, I realized I'm trying to ask how libraries fit into it. What does pornography have to do with the idea of libraries? By what means will librarians, librarians continue to safeguard creative readers instead of passive viewers? What kind of literacy should be appropriate for a more equal and fair share of information surplus? How to regain social trust when Google's business of fortune telling and selling has gained almost ultimate authority nowadays? Would it be acceptable for librarians to recognize themselves as metadata punks in order to prove their relevance in the 21st century? Mackenzie Wark perceives that making information free forced the ruling class to come up with new strategies to hackers' self-organizing activities, but he further suggests that a new tactic is needed to move forward from data punks to metadata punks. On the other hand, Alberto Manguel reminds us that societies, I quote, allow pornography, which embraces official notions of normal or decent behavior, to exist in specific context but zealously persecute artistic erotic expressions on which the authority of those in power is brought implicitly into question." The end of quote. If I'm to locate an analogy with these words, I perceive the hacking ethos and eros, along with its exclusion from cyber public realm, proves the existence of double standards that, according to Manguel, pornography requires for its reactionary reactionary purposes. In the contemporary marriage of librarianship with information science that precludes a subversive logic of erotic pleasure to be found in reading of a new user's needs which are being awakened from below. Reborn forces of dissent, hackers, pirates, infraproletariat, as Mackenzie Bark says, that challenge positions of a ne neoliberal vectoralist class further unlock imagination on the social contract of libraries, Sean Dockery expresses in his correspondence with Lawrence Lessig in terms of desire to have relationship with texts and others that is not mediated by market relations. I quote, so libraries have often mirrored rather than inverted power relations that underlie the social contracts that they almost underwrite. In contrast, I'm wondering if the various shadow libraries that have burgeoned online, the portable personal libraries that are shared offline, whether all of them reimagine the social contract of libraries and try to create a more insurgent imaginary of the library. Sharing such an instinct over this video conference, pondering blasphemic thoughts about ludic spaciousness of shadow libraries, I invoke again Manguel's perception that the ideal library disarms the curse of Babel. In other words, the ideal library is being rebuilt every time a reader loses themselves in a book to finish the impossible task of balancing between creativity and paranoia that share the same perception of a surplus of meaning. Without tackling the widespread impression of today that social platforms are gifts that resemble or even outdate libraries, we are too easily ending up with ideas of public benefits, not public failures. Lack of unmasking the commodity logic, which is hiding behind the proliferation of the disruptive nature of the social, usually leads to dismissal of discussions among the mainstream cyber librarians, in which the controversial clarification of issues that expose machinic surplus value are to be confronted. Librarians 
to be reliable agents in the public domain of cyberspace are then not to be seen as a brave new custodians of cultural technology which exploits privacy, but those whose expectations to recreate public life emphasize concerns related to Turing, Turing machines. Matteo Pasquinelli sees, I quote, as devices to accumulate valorizing information, extract metadata, calculate network surplus value, and feed machinic intelligence. The end of quote. In sum, the conduit metaphor of digital social factory is much better to replace with a syntax social boudoir introduced by Mackenzie work, since the level of disintegration of liberal distinction between public and private realms urge us to accept alter alternating between an emphasis on knowledge-based economy and desire-based economy, between immaterial labor and effective labor. The surplus abstraction of digital labor creativity under the platform capitalism, with attraction as its currency, emerged from a private boudoir, not a social fabric. A failure to perceive or question the content spectacle of user-generated data pool seems to lack more creative readers instead of passive viewers. Or, put it, or to put it differently, a boudoir is now more a place that safeguards human behavior from social conventions. Quite the opposite. The distribution of privacy without opacity, mystery and ambivalence, curiosity and risk-taking has been accepted to leak as a social norm. Will libraries recuperate its public mission in 21st century? will greatly rest on librarians eager to re-eroticize its behavior, as well as behavior of their users. In other words, regain slowness, passion and distance cyber flaneurs of today abandoned. At the end, I'd like to share some more thoughts uh, about the, how I conceived this uh, paper, which was actually uh, influenced by rereading uh, Charles Baudelaire's poetry that uh, reminded me on uh, uh, how the first time I heard uh, a word boudoir was during my uh, uh, poetry classes I have been taking 10 years ago as a student of comparative literature. Uh, ironically, I now teach uh, library and information science in the uh, room in which uh, once uh, we were uh, surrounded by books, now uh, we have computers, of course. So my idea is actually uh, emerge uh, from a need to contextualize a particular aim of reminding how interdisciplinary intersections between humanities and social science fruitfully converge in defense of technology education. Uh, Neil Postman uh, was writing about as a cru crucial teaching sub subject for the technopoly. Uh, finally, I'm not uh, 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 using the uh, 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 term technopoly, but I'm trying to, I, was, I, I, uh, I tried to coin uh, uh, a syntax and uh, defend uh, uh, its usability and uh, 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 relevance as a boudoir surplus. So uh, I'm more than open to uh, communicate with you and to uh, uh, start a discussion about the issue, uh, issues I presented in my paper. Thank you very much for uh, uh, letting me participate in this online conference. Uh, thank you.